You are listening to Accents, a radio show for literature, art, and culture. I'm your host, Katerina Stoikova, and my guest today is poet and translator, Katrin Young. Hi, Katrin. Hi, Katerina. Nice to be here. Nice to be here and nice to talk to you. Nice to meet you. This is your first appearance on Accents, and I'm hoping not the last. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, we have so much in common and so much to talk about. Let me introduce you to our listeners with a few biographical notes. Catherine E. Young is the author of Day of the Border Guards and the translator of Farewell Eilis. That is, uh, the original author is Akram Eilisli, right? Eilisli. Mm-hmm. Eilisli. Look at him, Anna Starubinets, and two poetry collections by in a cabbage. Young is a 2017 NEA Translation Fellow and served as the inaugurate Poet Laureate for Arlington, Virginia. Very impressive and very exciting. I know that you have three books coming up in near future. Please tell us about them. Okay, so I do have three books coming out in the next six months. This is a, probably the worst stretch of entire publication history to have three books coming out because it's so hard for us to get out, authors to get out and meet people who might be interested in them. The one that's coming out first, and I'll say, I'll say first, first something briefly about the other two because they're coming out later. One that's coming out later this fall is the first ever anthology of poetry co- uh, collected by uh, pe- from people who live in Arlington, Virginia, and the poems are generally about Arlington, Virginia. But it turns out Arlington, Virginia, which is a suburb of Washington, D.C., has a long and storied poetic history, and we have uh, poets in this anthology from all over the world. We have major American poets, such as Heather McHugh, Sandra Beasley, Richard Peabody, um, and we have had um, material come in in four languages, including Hindi and Russian. So those have been translated into the book. So what I thought was going to be a small local project has turned out to be a really rich and powerful collection of um, over 150 poems by 70 poets. And um, again, that'll be coming out later this fall. Um, the second thing that's coming out next spring is a, my second collection of work called Woman Drinking Absinthe. And um, that's still in the editing stage right now, but it's going to be, a, um, a, I think, a very interesting collection. It has themes of Me Too in it, but it also has a lot of um, references to references to Impressionism, Post-Impressionism, uh, Jap- uh, the, the cult of Jap- Japanese, all things Japanese that was flourishing in France around the turn of the 20th century. Um, opera, uh, so it's a uh, kind of an odd little duck, that one. Um, but the book that's coming out in September and the one that I'm going to be talking about today is called Look at Him. Uh, it's by the Russian writer Anna Starobinets. Starobinets is best known in Russia as Russia's Stephen King. So she's known for horror. She's known for her young adult work. And she's known for her children's work. And some of that work has made it into English. This book, Look at Him, is a memoir. Uh, is very different from anything else that she's written. It was extremely controversial in Russia. It was a finalist for the 2018 Nats Best Prize. It did not win. Um, and it, it unleashed a firestorm of anger and vituperation and condemnation in Russia. It is the story of Anna's pregnancy. Um, she was four months pregnant with a boy, went for a routine ultrasound, and it was discovered that the child had bilateral multicystic dysplastic kidney, uh, which is a mouthful. It's a kidney disease. Uh, in which cysts grow in the kidneys. Normally it only affects one kidney, but in this case it affected both kidneys. And what happens is the kidneys swell up, in this case five times the normal size, amniotic fluid is not created, and um, when the child, if the child even makes it to birth, uh, the lungs are not able to breathe because of the giant swelling in the stomach that compresses the lungs and other things. It's, it's, a, it's a death sentence. Um, and this memoir walks us through the experience of the diagnosis, um, the options that she has in Russia. She ends up going to Germany for medical treatment. And then the aftermath, not just for her as a woman, but 
for her entire family, her eight-year-old daughter, um, and, and then her response to the things that have happened to her and um, the work that she continues as a journalist to try to make sense of what's happened to her and to look at the situation in Russia, both from a medical and a social, social perspective. What was, what was controversial about this book? Was it from the government or? So a little background, um, up until the end of the Soviet period, the main means of um, contraception available in Russia, as in much of that part of the world, was abortion. In other words, there was not easily accessible, um, even condoms were not uh, accessible um, easily. And um, so, so there was a sort of culture of abortion And then in 2003, well after the Russian, uh, new Russian order had come in, uh, the, the Russian Orthodox Church managed to um, sway legislators to, um, cr to put in place legal safeguards saying there was no abortion allowed after 12 weeks, um, except in very rare cases and specific qu cases. What happens then if you were diagnosed with a child with a fatal birth defect after 12 weeks. Um, so uh, a large part of the journey of the memoir is trying to figure out what to do. There is no chance the child will survive. Um, and there is a great chance that if the child is born and lives for two or three minutes, those two or three minutes will be in excruciating pain. So what do you do? What are your options? Um, and uh, the choices that she made in the book, not everyone will agree with, and certainly not all of the readers agreed with. One of the other things that's, shall we say, controversial about the book is that it deals with issues of women's agency over their own bodies. It is an implicit critique of the Russian medical system. And um, many people found it also an expression of the author's privilege because she was able to leave Russia when she felt that the choices available to her there were not sufficient and uh, go somewhere else. That is not obviously Uh, an option that's open to most Russians. Russian medical, basic medical care for, for all people in all situations is available free in Russia. Um, but that uh, is very different from, shall we say, um, a high standard of care that you would pay for in a private clinic elsewhere in the world, including the United States. Um, and so uh, women of her status and with her resources are probably, her first pregnancy went through the regular rest, Russian system. Um, and she was well cared for and it turned out well. But this second pre pregnancy, um, she felt that she wanted to do better for the child. And um, those choices also uh, were perceived as offensive to people who didn't have those options. Yeah. Uh, so you translated this book and it's going to be published. Who is publishing it? It is coming out from Three String Press, which is part of Slavica. And Slavica is the publishing a publishing part of the University of Indiana Press. So that will be out in September. It's already up on their website. You can pre-order. Um, it's, um, I think, about 194 pages. It's a fairly short book, and it's divided into two parts. The first part, and the part that I think, for me, is most compelling, is the memoir itself, um, which is a little bit over half of the book. But the second half of the book uh, is a part of the author's healing as well. And what she does is she interviews a number of people in Russia, women who have been in situations similar to hers, who have lost children, um, and um, explores an issue that is, uh, I think, common in every country. When you lose a child during pregnancy, um, there are many people who tend to gloss over that loss. People who've had miscarriages often speak about this. Uh, it wasn't a real person. It was just a fetus. It's, you know, it didn't come out in the world. Why are you grieving? And um, that's a particular issue in Russia for a number of reasons. So she wanted to explore that with women who had gone through the situation. Also, she wanted to look at the medical help that they had or had not received and compare it with her experience. Um, and then finally, she went back to Germany to interview the medical professionals who had helped her Um, in the institution where she had, had, had received care and uh, did a comparison with standard practice in Russia. 
The interesting thing here is while the memoir side of the book details her experience in some detail with the Russian medical establishment, establishment, nobody from that establishment would speak with her when she wanted to do formal interviews. So um, that is an important and compelling argument, I think, uh, for her having written the book in the first place. The information doesn't exist in Russia. It's very much a do-it-yourself um, situation in terms of people who've had this experience of losing a child, finding like-minded people and creating their own support groups because there's almost nothing um, in terms of professional existing circles of people who can help you walk through the stages of grief surrounding losing a child. And there is also no consensus on what you should do. Some of the women that she interviews in the book talk about rituals that they have created for themselves based on Slavic religious tradition or other, other, um, other traditions for dealing with grief. Uh, one woman wore full mourning for 40 days after the loss of her unborn child um, and uh, did none of the household um, work uh, insofar as was possible during that 40 day period. That's maybe an extreme, but it's, a, it's a, essentially the point being made is Russian society is not providing the medical resources or the psychological resources or even the sort of informal resources within the family um, very often for people who have experienced this kind of loss and grief. And it's a, and it's a, um, a time and place where people are trying to find their own way and some are, some are failing. A large part of the memoir is the panic attacks that the author is experiencing when she can't find help for the loss and the grief with which she's dealing. Well, as far as I know, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you have been translating from Russian both poetry and, uh, and prose. What is more difficult? Oh, that's such an interesting question. I tend to think of myself as a poet rather than a prose writer. So in that sense, poetry is maybe more natural feeling for me. Um, the first large prose project that I translated was uh, Akram Ailis's Farewell Ailis. Uh, that project is a fascinating one because uh, it is a, a trilogy of novellas by an Azeri writer, but it speaks about, as a sort of through theme, um, um, the terrible uh, anger and um, uh, hatred among contemporary Azeris and, and Armenians, Azerbaijanis and Armenians. Um, and the author himself is a, a de facto, lives under de facto house arrest and is for, for all intents and purposes, a political prisoner in Baku, the capital of Azerbaijan for writing these novels, not because he's politically active, although he did at one point sit in the national legislature, but later, but because he wrote novels that were uncomfortable for the ruling uh, authorities to hear. And in fact, um, two of the three books of the trilogy were never even published in Azerbaijan. They were published in Russia um, because he could not publish them in Azerbaijan. And I should say, in addition to the critique of the, um, the way that the current Azerbaijani regime is handling the situation with Armenia, which of course is, is flaring even as you and I are speaking today, they're fighting again. Um, uh, they, there is a strong critique of uh, crony capitalism and um, authoritarianism, um, uh, traits that are, shall we say, indicative of uh, the current Azer Azerbaijani government, which is generally rated one of the least, um, least democratic in the world. So, so this book was my first uh, big uh, leap into prose. Um, and because of who the author was, because of his political situation, and because of the danger that I felt he was in by having the book come out in English, he's 88 years old, um, I was very, very careful with those words. I was extremely careful and probably a little too literal in the translation because I wanted very, very much not for my words not to make the situation any worse when I translated the work. Um, I am... The, book, the books are wonderful, the stories are wonderful, um, and I'm very, very happy with them. But that was sort of a unique situation, working with someone who's, who's I mean, maybe it's a little bit hyperbolic, but maybe it's not to say that their life was in danger by what I did. 
um, and by the publicity that I did for the book. So for all of those reasons, um, the actual translation was a little bit more um, buttoned up, a little bit more constricted than, than um, I, I had much reason to understand other translation was. This book, Anastara Binet's Look at Him, um, was not that way at all. It, it, for one thing, Akram Alisli is a uh, writing um, much in the tradition of uh, the great writers of the world. He's translated himself into Azeri Garcia Marquez um, and um, uh, Salman Rushdie, and those writers influence his work. Uh, and he's very, he's, he uses language richly and beautifully. He uses the classical figures of speech. Um, people who translate from Russian are always trying to figure out ways to cut the long sentences into sentences that are of a short enough length for American readers to digest, right, to digest. But when I started trying to do that with Akram Ailisli's words, I found that I couldn't because he had set, structured them as a climax or anti-metaboly or the, you know, the classical figures of speech, their patterns. And if you cut the sentences, you destroy the rhetorical pattern. Right. So uh, that was a particular challenge with that book. This book, on the other hand, is uh, Anna Sarabinitz is living in the internet age. One of the, in the first chapter, after she receives a diagnosis, the first thing she does is go on her cell phone to look up what this thing is that the doctor has said. And um, it's very, very much a, uh, she's a young writer. She came, I, I believe she was born around 1980. She came of age, you know, sort of right at the end of the Soviet period, post-Soviet period. So her way of being in the world is quite different and her language is quite different. Um, there, there were no particular challenges with this book, although there was, a, there was some lingo she makes fun of, um, uh, there's a sort of cult of motherhood among pregnant women, and she makes fun of them using Russian um, diminutive um, words. Uh, and that was a challenge to Biri Minyushki, which are um, very pregnant women, but pregnant women in a very sickly sweet way. And so I, I worked for a long time trying to get that comment into English, that word into English, and I ended up with preggy weggy, uh, mm. which is ugly. Mm -hmm. Perfect, perfect, really. Well, but ugly, right? Um, and, and then they, they took the, Sorry? It's very ironic, too. Ironic. It, it is, it, it is, right? But the, these preggy weggy women walk around talking about their little belly dwellers and the little babies, in their, and it's just disgustingly sweet. And the way that she does it in the, in the prose is just so brilliant. And trying to get that into English was maybe the most uh, daunting. Uh, try, just trying to get the, the, the proper degree of sarcasm and envy and, you know, because these women who she's watching in the, in the doctor's office, they're going to have these babies, right? And she's sitting there knowing she's not going to have hers. Um, and so there's yeah. a whole layer of pathos in addition yeah. to the, you know, the, the sarcasm and the, and the um, contempt, really, for the, the, these happy little people living in their happy little worlds and envy. Would you kindly read uh, for our listeners from the book? I will read from the first chapter. It's called Chapter One, Birth Defect. Well, is it a girl or a boy? I ask the ultrasound specialist. He's already been able to show me the brain. The baby has a very good brain and heart. Everything's well developed there. He's already said the measurements correspond to 16 weeks of development. He's already asked me the absurd question to which I've become accustomed over 16 weeks. Who have you got at home? And I've already answered that I have an eight-year-old girl at home. So this time I'd like a boy. And now I'm asking if it's a boy or a girl, but for some reason he's pursing his lips tightly, as if he's got a giant sour berry in his mouth and is deciding whether or not to spit it out. He silently guides the probe around my stomach and looks silently at the monitor. He's silent a little too long. And then he says, it's a boy. But something's wrong with his voice, with the tone. Again, he purses his lips. I suddenly remember the beginning of my own science fiction book, The Living. The probe cheeped and the doctor considered what he was seeing. I asked, is something wrong? He was silent. Is something wrong with the baby? And now it's November of 2012, 
and I myself am in the office of a doctor who is silent and the ultrasound cheeps and I ask, is something wrong with the baby? He resolves finally to get rid of his sour berry. Does anyone in your family have kidney disease? No. I don't like the structure of the kidneys in this fetus. It's a hyperechogenic structure. For a few moments, I even feel relief. Kidneys, no big deal. Kidneys, well, that's important, of course, but it's not the heart, not the lungs, not the brain. He has a good heart and brain, but we can somehow treat kidneys, especially as there's no her hereditary kidney disease in the family. That's probably a good indicator for the prognosis. And they take up the greater part of the fetal abdominal cavity, he adds. They are five times larger than they should be. It's possible to not know what a hyperechogenic structure is, but it's absolutely clear the kidneys shouldn't take up the whole stomach. So naturally, I understand that this is bad, very bad. It's possible that the fetus has polycystic kidneys disease, he says. Wipe yourself off and get dressed. It seems that at that moment, for the first time, I split in two. With shaking hands, one of me wipes the gel off my stomach. But the other me attentively and calmly watches the first, and the doctor as well, and she's generally quite observant. For example, she, no she notices that he no longer calls my baby a baby, just a fetus. You need an ultrasound by an expert. He writes the name of a clinic and a doctor's last name on a piece of paper, preferably this doctor. He's a specialist in fetal birth defects. I ask, is it very serious? He answers, but it's the answer to a different question. I'm just an ultrasound doctor. I'm not an expert and not the Lord God, and I make mistakes. Go see an expert. It seems to me that he also wants to add and pray, but he doesn't say anything more. It's the first, it's said the first stage of grief is denial. Having learned terrible news, it's as if you can't immediately take it in. You maintain that it's just a mistake or that they're knowingly lying to you, that the ultrasound doctor is a charlatan, that he's sending you to his friend for another ultrasound in order to take your money. Yes, I've seen that kind of thing in online chat rooms dedicated to the pathology of pregnancy. And even my mother, having learned the results of the ultrasound, passes through this stage very quickly, right before my eyes. It's a normal defense mechanism, but for some reason, it doesn't work for me. Even before I went online to read about polycystic kidney disease, even before the diagnosis was announced, in that moment when he looked at the monitor and was silent, I understood that things were very bad, really bad. I pay for the ultrasound and go out into the wet November darkness. I walk along the street, then I grasp that I'd come in a car, but I can't remember where I left it. For 20 minutes, I drag myself around the obstetrics and gynecology clinic on Bolshaya Pirogovka Street, forgetting what exactly I'm looking for. It's hard to walk, as if I'm moving inside a thick black cloud. Eventually, I stumble upon my car, climb in, and go online on my phone. I type in fetal polycystic kidney disease and open up more and more links. And I understand that polycystic kidney disease occurs in two types, dominant adult and recessive infantile. That do the dominant po uh, polycystic kidney disease is exactly the kind that runs in families and that people generally live with it. But recessive is what we're talking about in my case, if it is my case. In the photographs, there are deformed infants with flattened faces and giant inflated stomachs, dead infants. They don't survive with infantile polycystic kidney disease. The thick black cloud surrounding me suddenly begins to crawl into my mouth and my throat. I'm suffocating. There's absolutely nothing for me to breathe. The other me, the one who's cold and calm, notices then that I'm not simply sitting in the car and staring at the telephone screen gasping for breath, but am at the same time driving along 10th anniversary of October Street and everyone's honking at me because I'm crawling into oncoming traffic. By some miracle, I manage to drive home all the same. I can't breathe 
And when my daughter, Sasha, we call her Little Badger, comes happily running with the question, is it a boy or a girl? And my husband, also Sasha, comes out of the kitchen with wet hands and inquires offhandedly, is everything okay? I can't speak and only gasp and gasp for air, but there is no air. My black cloud doesn't let it into my lungs. What's wrong with the baby? Big Sasha grabs me by the shoulders. What's wrong with our baby? Little Badger looks at us in fright and prepares to cry. The observant calm me also looks at us and reproach, reproachfully. She doesn't like the fact that we're scaring our daughter. She doesn't like the fact that I can't pull myself together. But it amuses her that we all seem to be playing a scene from a soap opera. I can't breathe, I sob exactly as if I were fulfilling the conventions of the genre. My husband brings me a small glass of whiskey and says, drink it down. Looking at my stomach, which hasn't been showing long at all, he adds, nothing bad will happen to the baby from such a tiny amount. Drink. I swallow the contents of the glass and I really do relax. I breathe. I look at little badger and big badger. Just this morning, we were discussing what the new baby's nickname would be. Sasha was afraid the baby would usurp her position of Little Badger, but I said we'd call the baby Littlest Badger, and no one would be offended. And now I say to them both, say to my badgers, it's a boy, but he won't live, probably. For the rest of the night, my husband and I sit at the computer reading about polycystic kidney disease. From time to time, I weep, but my husband tells me that nothing's definite yet, that we need first to wait for the ultrasound with the expert that I'm panicking too soon. And Little Badger makes me a card with a drawing of a flower. Mama, everything will be fine, is written on it in the clumsy handwriting for which they scold her in school. And she also drags all her toys to me, one after the other, and says they'll be my talismans, that they'll protect me. That same night, for the first time in 16 weeks, the baby begins to stir inside me. Their soft sliding movements, as if he's stroking me, as if we've all gathered together, the whole Badger family, except Big Badger and Little Badger are on the outside, and Littlest Badger is inside me, as if everything will be fine, like in the movies. Wow. This yeah. is stunning, you know. I want to now go in the room and weep. Yeah. Did you cry translating? <sighs> yes, but I was also, I, you know, I, I was trying very hard not to because I thought that if I let that happen, it would overwhelm what I was trying to do. I mean, it, it's a job to do to translate. And, and it's also a protection because you've got that mechanical thing that you're doing, right? And it's not just mechanical, of course, it's also emotional and creative, but you've got that, that task that you're doing to kind of stand between you and the material. Um, so you have that part of you that translates and you have that part of you that is observing you translate. Right, right. Like, like in the in the memoir where she's got yeah. two people working at the, you know, it was in her in her own yeah. head, right? Yeah, right. And such interesting to give both perspectives at the same time. Lovely writing and absolutely brilliant translating. She's how fabulous. Did, how did you uh, fall in love with the Russian language? I was exposed to Russian as a small child around uh, well. 11, 12, um, and was taught a few words and the alphabet. And um, then the teacher for, went off. And uh, for some reason, it stuck in my brain that Russian was really just writing English words with Cyrillic letters. Um, and at that point, I was living in a place where there was no possibility of studying it. And I wasn't able to get back to studying it until college. Um, and so I ended up majoring in Russian civilization and, and I lived in the Soviet Union for a semester and I went back several times uh, in Soviet times. And I also lived in Russia in the 90s. Um, so it's been a back and forth sort of love affair is almost not the right word. It's almost an addiction. Uh, I, I can't let it go. 
um, I have been writing poetry all my life, and sort of that was sort of a parallel track. Um, but I didn't get very serious about Russian, and I have a I have a master's degree in Soviet studies, which is like counting missiles and stuff like that. But but the the connection of literature, language, my own writing, uh, came much much later, and I think it's it was became strongest when I was living in Moscow in the '90s, and. Um, I uh, was able to work with a teacher there, um, Nadezhda Mirova, who didn't speak any English. And what we decided to do, what I wanted to do, was to study Russian poetry in depth. So between the two of us, we spent about two years reading the canon of Russian literature, um, starting before Pushkin and working through contemporary literature. And um, um, so it was mainly for my own edification, but I also found that the work I did in Russian poetry, reading Russian poetry, um, was tremendously influential on the poetry I was writing in English. Yes, of course. Well, yeah. you know, I mean, most American poets would, you know, say, oh, I, you know, I love Walt Whitman or I love Emily Dickinson or those are my big influences, you know, whoever it was, you know, whether it was Ginsburg or it doesn't matter. For me, my influences largely tended to be the Russian poets. Uh, Pushkin, uh, Akhmatova, um, a poet that I've translated a lot, Ina Kabush. I like her work very, very much, and it has really influenced the way I put together words in English. Of course, the Russian formal tradition of poetry is very different from contemporary American poetry, and there's always a tension in what I'm writing uh, between those two sort of different realms. The other thing I would say about the study that I did in Moscow, my teacher, Nadezhda Mirova, did not speak any English. So all the work I was doing with her, not just reading the words in Russian, but also the conversation we were having about writing, about literature, about the literary life, um, all of that was, was happening in my brain in a different part of my brain, in the language realm of my brain. And I, I, think, I think just working in the language, not just as a reader, you know, going to Pushkin or going to Tolstoy or going to whatever, but also as a person trying to work with the words. And, and looking at it, um, not just not just receiving literature, but trying to the degree that I was able to to discuss it. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. It triggered something. Um, I eventually went back and got an MFA, and uh, I sort of stumbled into translating as part of that Master of Fine Arts um, in poetry. And do you have any of your work translated in Russian, maybe by yourself or by somebody else? I have a few poems. Yeah. Um, and um, I have actually a couple of videos that were made for me by the wonderful director uh, from Novosibirsk, Papo Golovkin, um, that, that uh, uh, they are my, my tra there are four of them, there are my translations of Ina Kabush, videos were made in both English and Russian, and then he took two of my poems and had them translated uh, into Russian uh, by the wonderful poet, my friend, Aksenia Emilyanova. She did the translations into Russian and then he filmed videos of those. Um, so there are a few works out there. Well, uh, I, I'm not capable of translating my work into Russian. My great, my greatest, you know, if I could do my life over again, it would, have, it would be to have been a better Russian student earlier in my life and somehow have developed the ability to write a poem in Russian because that is my sort of, that's the thing on my bucket list. That's what I want to be able to do. Now you translate and write in, in two languages, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's, I mean, that is... For me, that's the holy grail. That's what I'd like to be able to do. Um, somehow I've been, I'm able to do that and I'm so thankful, but I haven't been able to translate prose. That was, you know, my, my question is like, uh, somehow, you know, people have asked me, do you want to translate this, you know, piece of prose, novel, whatever. And I just say, no, I can't, I can't. Um, I don't, I just can't s sit still for that long, I guess. <laughs> and plus I have interest in working in the, uh, jewelry of poetry, you know, mm. I want to see this. Yeah. Uh, and I want to work at this level. Yes. And I want to do many things at the same time with my life. So it is, I admire anybody who would sit down and write a novel, for example. But I admire 10 times as much somebody who would sit down and translate it because I think that requires qualities 
of not only language, but also character that I haven't developed in myself. So hats off to you, wow. Catherine, for what you've done, what you're doing, you know, and looking at, uh, at your CV and your website, at the way that you have spent your time translating that is so admirable you know i don't i think certainly in the poetry world that i work in there is i don't know a, a misimpression that prose is somehow more pedestrian in terms of the writing in other words that it's you know put a word after another um but in fact for me you're still working with the, the jewel of the word, as you, as, you know, as you put it. In other words. So it doesn't matter whether it's in a line of poetry or in a line of prose, but of course you choose your projects carefully. I mean, I, there are probably you know, many, many things that I just wouldn't be interested in translating, especially a long work of prose, because mm -hmm. it does take, I mean, this took, by the, you know, the, the Eileesley book from start, start to finish was probably four or five years because it took so long to market it and to find a publisher. This book was, went much more quickly but it's still many months of your life that you're devoting to someone else's creative output, yep. right? And of course, translation is good. For me, translation is a supremely creative act. And I don't look at the work that I publish in translation any differently from the work that I publish as a poet, having written it in English. In other words, they're both creative efforts for me, but so many people don't feel that way. Um, and that's, that's, that's a great shame. Um, at the moment, I'm working on a, an anthology of poetry from the Second World War. Uh, it will be published in Moscow. It won't be available here. But so we're taking these sort of old chestnuts of Russian military poetry, frontline poetry, and trying to get them into uh, an anthology in English that will be published in Moscow. And there I'm working with 11 other translators. And it's astonishing to me how different their approaches are some people are, are, are recreating the meter and the rhyme of the Russian to try to you know, give the music of the Russian in English. Other that is people, difficult. It is difficult. Impossible. I, I personally try to do that, but that's, that's not my end goal. In other words, that's, if it happens along the way, great. For me, this is my personal philosophy. I want a work that is accessible to an English reader who doesn't know Russian, who doesn't know the context, and yet can still hear music in the translation. For me, though, for me, yeah. that means translating it as if I were writing it in English. And of course, meter, rhyme, syntax, all of those things are completely different between the two languages. And so I don't look at reproducing the Russian as my end goal at all. I am looking to produce a beautiful poem that sounds like it was originally written in English. You know, sort of in the way that if you think about uh, a musical score, right? Beethoven wrote the notes on a piece of paper. And every, every orchestra that reconstructs that symphony is going to do it in a different way based on who's in the orchestra, what the acoustics are in the room, who's in the audience. And it'll be different from era to era because of the, mus uh, the uh, musical instruments themselves, the conducting styles. So I look at what I'm doing sort of that way. And I, by the way, I stole that metaphor from Edith Grossman. I think she stole it from somebody else. That notion of you've got notes on a paper. That's the work published in Russian, right? But you, it's up to you, the translator, to make that work sing for your audience right here today in contemporary America, in my case. Um, and that's, but that's only one way to look at translation. and. Um, even among my 11 translators with whom I'm working, that is not necessarily the, the way that most of them translate. Well, I did translate a large book of contemporary Bulgarian poetry. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was important for me to select only poems that I believe I can do a good job on. Right. So, there were some that I, some that I started and I abandoned because I'm like, that's not going to work out, out. And there were others like, this is a great poem in Bulgarian, but it will never work in English. Right. Or it would hobble somehow. Does right. it, has it happened to you? I mean, do you choose the poems to translate or do you just try to make the most? When I'm doing my own projects, I do choose the poems. I choose mm -hmm. the poets who speak to me. I choose um, work. I, I mean, 
look, nobody's going to get rich on, on translating poetry. In fact, most of us aren't even going to get most the, the majority of the work published. So you do it because you love it. Right. And, um, and that, it makes no sense to me to translate work that I don't actively care about. Um, now, there are other projects that I've been associated with where I've been paid to do the work. And then I, you know, I don't have the choice, the leeway um, generally about what I translate. But um, by and large, um, you know, because it's, it's, a, it's something you do for love, you have a lot of control over, over what, yeah. you, what you produce. And, and that makes me really happy because there's, there, there's literally nothing that I can, I can have to point to and say, you know, I'm really embarrassed that I translated that work or I, I really wish I hadn't, my name weren't on that. Um, it, it, it's all about love um, and, and what a great gift, right? How many of us are able to do work that, that we um, stand behind and to such a great degree always? It's, it's sort of the, it's, it's sort of the golden, you know, the golden place to be. And fortunately, you know, translation, it's traditionally been a woman's profession. Um, it's low paying, but it does pay. And compared to poetry, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a better way to make a living. Hmm. You don't say, right? <laughs> <laughs> Neither of them. You're not going to get wealthy off of either of them. That's for sure. There was, there was this quote there was this quote that i found on the internet and i can't remember who said it but um there are few there are many ways to starve but few as eccentric as uh private uh, as, um translation from bulgarian you know I, I, uh, I i read that somewhere and i and i thought it was funny and i wrote it down yes would you would you read to us another chapter or another excerpt yes. from? Okay, thank you. I will. I will. This is the third chapter. So she's gone to the ultrasound technician and had a an absolutely horrific experience there. Um, sort of old style Soviet medical experience where she was treated as an object. Um, she was uh, having a very um, extensive private exam with the doctor and without her permission, 15 medical students filed into the room while she was not wearing any clothes. Um, and she was discussed as if she were a piece of meat on a slab. And uh, the doctor announced without even speaking to her, these, these, these children don't survive. So she's lying on a table with 15 strangers staring at her and the doctor is talking to them about the fact that her child is not going to survive. So chapter three, just a fetus. Little Badger is an optimist. She believes that a miracle will happen for us and Littlest Badger will be born. For her, this is probably the stage of denial. But it's important to her that I believe as well, as if my faith could fix things. She follows me around like a shadow. But don't you believe just a teeny bit? Don't miracles happen? Don't you believe even a smidge? Even 1%? Even a whisker? I don't know how to answer her, so I say what I'm thinking. I don't believe. Not 1%, not a smidge, not a whisker. My stage of denial has already passed. Probably it's cruel, but I don't want to give Little Badger hope. The more hope there is now, the worse it will be later. They say the second stage of grief is anger. It's not that I'm angry, but I want to know whose fault it is. The main person, the one whose fault all of it is, is me. I run through these 16 weeks in my head and find many sins. I didn't rejoice to the necessary degree at the conceiving of new life in me. The preggy weggy women write in online chat rooms, when I saw those two cherished lines, my joy knew no bounds. That's their mantra, their incantation. It's like the beginning of a prayer, as if there's a special deity who monitors their chat room and who must be appeased. And I didn't appease the deity. I did things wrong in general. There were limits to my joy. When I saw the two lines on the test, I felt scared. It's true that at my first pregnancy, which resulted in Little Badger, I also felt scared, but that's not important. This time, I felt even more scared. Furthermore, I drank wine the night he was conceived. I smoked. I didn't eat regularly. I didn't go swimming. 
worked too much, wrote a new book, wrote a screenplay, wrote articles. And now I also need to write. Up until this nightmare began, that is until three days ago, I was working on a long article, moreover on deadline. But now I can't write anything. I send the editor in chief an email about birth defects and about the fact that I can't do anything right now. The response arrives, of course, we'll postpone it. That article is about children the social service authorities want to remove from their family because their home is dirty. There are cockroaches, dogs, cats, rats, and fleas because the place stinks, because their mama takes in every stray animal she sees, because at some point the social service authorities also took their mama from her own mama and she grew up in an orphanage and has no understanding of what a normal home is. I want to stand up for them to write that families can't be separated, that the vicious cycle of being an orphan must be broken, that these children are attached to one another and their mother no matter what, and that they can't be taken away, that a social worker must work with them, that although they stink, they're happy. In an orphanage, they'll be clean and unhappy. I spoke with volunteers and psychologists. I visited them in their stinking, vagrant hovel. It's their fault. They infected me. I was there during the first trimester at exactly the stage when the organs form. It's her fault, their criminal, dim-witted mother. She has four children and doesn't bother about any of them. How can she live in a dump but give birth to healthy children? How can her sons live and mine not survive? Because I didn't have to visit them in their unsanitary state. It's my fault. But then again, no. Polycystic kidney disease is a genetic illness. It's impossible to be infected with it. So it's not my fault. So it's my fault, not because I visited that hovel, but for a different reason. I know why. I committed a sin, the most important sin. I once said I didn't want him, didn't want a second child. I said that maliciously during a fight with Big Badger. Words have power. It was sometime during the eighth week probably at exactly the stage when the kidneys were forming. Big Badger, it's his fault. His fault that I said that. And besides, he said the wrong words. He said it was a bad time, that we had too much work right now. You didn't want him, I attacked Big Badger. You said he'd mess everything up. Well, are you happy now? Big Badger says, no, I'm not happy. In fact, I wanted him too. And he adds helplessly, I wanted to play soccer with him. I'm ashamed, but I want to keep picking at this some more. And now there won't be any baby, no baby. And then he tries to persuade me that it's not a baby, but a fetus. A fetus can't exist outside my body. A fetus doesn't yet live in the full meaning of the word. He argues, he insists, he wants to comfort me, but I fall into despair. My baby is alive, he kicks, he stirs around. I shout, don't you dare call him a fetus, he's a person. Fine, but can I call him an embryo? Embryo sounds better. We conduct a teleological argument about the soul of an embryo. My husband, who was baptized in the Russian Orthodox Church, insists that an embryo probably doesn't have a soul. I who was never baptized, insists that he has a soul and that I feel that soul, an additional pure soul inside of me. Fine, says Big, Ma Big Badger, it's clearer to you. He gives in simply to soothe me. He continually gives in to me and soothes me. He cooks, he goes to the store, he washes dishes, he prepares little badger's inhaler and gargle for her throat. He works. He begs me to eat. He hugs me and strokes my head and says, I'm here. He talks on the phone with my parents and his parents. I lie around and weep, but like the wolf in the old video game, he tries to catch all the eggs in all the baskets. He's here. However, that little boy with enormous kidneys isn't inside him, but inside me. It will fall to me to kill him very, very soon or else it will fall to me to carry him to term and to watch as he dies.
Thank you so much for reading these excerpts from this book. And please tell us again where our listeners can find the book. The book is called Look at Him by Anna Starobinitz, and the publisher is Three String Books, which is part of Slavica. If you go to my website, which is katherineyoungpoet.com, uh, there is a page devoted to Anna Starobinitz in this book, and it's got some links to some early reviews of the book, and it also has got, if you, it's got publisher or ordering information, so if you look there, katherineyoungpoet.com. Thank you very much, Catherine, for coming on Accents and talking to me about your creative work, your translation, your writing, your traveling. Thank you so much, Katerina. It was a great pleasure. Wonderful. Thank you so much.